Testament of the Christian Bible from the ninth chapter of the Gospel of Mark. After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John with him and led them up to a high mountain where they were all alone. There he was transfigured before them. His clothes became dazzling white, whiter than anyone in the world could bleach them. And there appeared before them Elijah and Moses who were talking to Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us put up three shelters, one for you, one for Moses and one for Elijah. He did not know what to say. They were so frightened in this moment. Then a cloud appeared and covered them. And a voice came from the cloud. This is my son whom I love. Listen to him. I have a friend who loves people. He's an extrovert who loves entertaining. He loves cooking for people and hosting them at his home for pool parties in the backyard with festive cocktails and hors d'oeuvres. I, on the other hand, am not one who loves people in that way, in that way. I mean, I'm a pastor, so I, I guess I should love people. I deal with people, but I am not one who gets my energy from people. People actually, and I'm sure I'm speaking for some of the introverts out there, uh, people seem to, seem to take a little bit of energy from me. It is not that I don't love people or enjoy sharing time and meaningful conversation with them. It just requires a lot of energy. And, and I must make sure I'm in a good mood, that my batteries are fully charged, that who I elect to interact with will beget a healthy and robust experience that will leave me full enough to forge ahead in this difficult world. Yes, we are in a difficult era where things are zapping our energy right and left from never ending calendars full of Zoom meetings to the fatigue that comes along with being in quarantine from the ongoing political discord to the ever present and damaging effects of poverty and classism in a country that routinely disregards its poor so many things are taking up space in our minds. So many things take our energy. So when we have a moment to decide how we're going to spend our time, I take it. As a pastor and, and one who has served as a chaplain in hospitals, I don't always get to choose who I interact with. We serve who we serve with open hearts and minds, even in the midst of weariness and discomfort. Thus, when my friend, the entertainer, the host with the most, invites me to an event, I usually ask one pressing question. Who all gonna be there? Yes, I say it just like that. Who all gonna be there? Who's coming to this gathering? Who all gonna be there? This is a question that we ask and we joke about in my friend group. We are usually trying to discern whether or not we're going to attend. We, we need to know who all going to be there. Is this a three-person event or is this a 30-person event? I'm an introvert, so I got to know these things. Is it, is it people that I know or do I have to put on my good first impression outfit? Who all going to be there? I used to think that this was a rude question many years ago. It seemed snobbish and exclusivist to be inquiring about the guest list of a gathering that you are not the host of. But I got older and the question of who's showing up became more important. The issue of who I am surrounded by becomes more important with each passing year. It is not just who's going to be there, but who are they showing up with? What will they bring into the space? Who are they surrounded by? And how will that shape how we head back into the world? 
in the Christian liturgical calendar from my tradition, this Sunday is called Transfiguration Sunday. It's the Sunday that we honor the story that I read earlier where Jesus was transfigured on a mountain while teaching his disciples. Earlier, I read that version from Mark. It is a mythological and magical story, a lot like Cinderella, right? Jesus, after recruiting several people to join his social movement, a poor people's campaign of sorts, heads up to the top of a mountain to show them something special. They have followed Jesus, this carpenter from Nazareth, who has been healing people and speaking life into people, this carpenter who has been fighting for liberation and speaking truth to power. They've been with him as he has walked on water. They've been with him as he has fed 5,000 hungry people with limited supplies proving that there is in fact enough food for everyone to eat and be full. But Jesus wanted to show them something else, something spectacular, something divine. I could only imagine that they were tired at this point in their journey with Jesus. After dealing with large crowds and sleeping in questionable places, I know the introverted disciples must have needed some rest and rejuvenation. So when Jesus asked them to follow him up to the mountain, I imagine one or two of them asking, now Jesus, who all gonna be there? Who all gonna be there? Like, like Jesus, we are tired. Is, is it just going to be one or two of us up there? Or are we about to have a dinner party with another 5,000 people? Who all going to be there? As the story goes, Jesus all of a sudden is transformed. The clouds open up, lightning strikes, and he is transformed out of his regular carpenter dusty clothes into all white, an all white dazzling outfit. It's a lot like when the fairy godmother comes and sprinkles the little fairy dust on Cinderella. All of a sudden, Jesus is transfigured and the disciples are caught off guard. They are scared. What is happening? We don't understand. And in addition to Jesus being transfigured, these two strange people show up beside him. Elijah, the prophet, and Moses, the prophet. For those of you who may be a little familiar with Judaism and the Hebrew Bible, these are very prominent figures in our Hebrew scriptures. Moses, the prophet who led his people out of captivity, and Elijah, the other prophet who spoke to his neighbors who were oppressed, they show up. Jesus's forefathers, Jesus's ancestors show up beside him in this moment of transfiguration. What I love about Cinderella, besides being obsessed with the Whitney Houston, Brandy Norwood version, what I love about Cinderella is not so much that she herself is transformed in that moment she gets to go to the ball. That is phenomenal. Uh, but what I really loved about Cinderella was the fairy godmother. I was always so fascinated with this person who just showed up to speak life into this person, this person who just showed up and sprinkled a little, a little bit of hope, a little bit of joy into Cinderella's life. This is Elijah and Moses showing up to verify that Jesus is who he says he is, the prophet for the people, the prophet for liberation. I love Transfiguration Sunday. It is my favorite Sunday because, well, one, I'm from New Orleans and it's the Sunday of Mardi Gras. So, you know, this is the first time in years that Mardi Gras has been canceled due, the, due to the pandemic. But I love Transfiguration Sunday because we get to talk about the ancestors. We get to talk about the people who walk beside us, who, who show up next to us in our moments of transformation. In times like these, my friends, in order for us to do the life-giving work of justice and liberation, of setting the captives free, of speaking truth to power, we are called to be transfigured. 
We are called to be transformed, to make the leap from complacency to holy confrontation. We are called to be transformed, made anew as we morph into the change agents that are need to fight for equity. But in addition to simply being transformed, we need to be surrounded by those who call forth greatness in us. We need to be surrounded by those living or dead who inspire us to press on even in the face of uncertainty by the prophets and the mystics, the poets and the artists who call us to imagine a world beyond the one we have been given. A world where there is affordable housing, a world where there is the sharing of resources and, and access to quality education for all. We need to be surrounded not by the folks who belittle us or disrupt our sanity, the folks who empty our wells or call us toward unholy divisiveness. We must call on those who pour into us when our tanks are low. We must call on those who humble us when our egos are unhealthy, who speak to the place of our souls that make us rise up and take action. Who are you surrounded by, my friends? I think about the poets whose words fill my soul and surround me in times of turmoil and uncertainty. Maya Angelou and Lucille Clifton. I think about the musicians who provide a soundtrack for the revolution and the restoration. Mahalia Jackson and India Ari. I think about my late grandmothers, Myrtle Brooks Belazan and Wilhelmina Dillon Howard, who scrubbed floors and nursed people back to health so that I could fight for liberation in the 21st century. Who do you show up with? Who are you surrounded by? When the time comes for the transformation to happen, my friends, who all gonna be there? I like to think that every time I show up, like Jesus had Elijah and Moses, like Cinderella had her fairy godmother, I like to think that every time I show up, there is Myrtle on one side and Wilhelmina on the other. I like to think that every time I show up, there is Toni Morrison on one side telling me to love my flesh and there's Lucille Clifton on the other side telling me to celebrate that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Who do you show up with? Beloved, when you walk into the room, the people should see you in your transfiguration. They should see beside you the people who have called forth the greatness in you. Who will you show up with? In your moment of transfiguration, who all gonna be there? I'd like you to take this moment in the sermon, if you can, to type in the chat some of the people who have inspired you who show up when you show up. It could be a parent that has gone on. It could be a poet that you love, a musician. I want you to, to type in the chat if you can. Call those names out. Who do you show up with? Who do you show up with? Who are you surrounded by? Go ahead and take 30 seconds if you, if you can, if you are able to, to type that in the chat. Yes, Ona and Zoe, somebody says they show up with Gail, James, Martha, Bobby, Phoenix, Natasha, Sadie, Janie, Lynn Tolley, uh, Becky Watkins, uh, Becky Floyd, George and Pete, grandfather and uncle. Somebody said they show up with their mom. Somebody said they show up with William on one side and Gloria on the other. Somebody say they show up with Sadie Lansdale. Oh, I show up with Sadie Lansdale too. 
uh, somebody say they show up with E.O. Wilson and uh, I, I don't want to mispronounce this, uh, Ajamu Baraka. Uh, somebody say they show up with Martha and Rosa and Rose and mom, dad, husband, daughter, Nina, Simone, yes. Somebody says they show up with Maya and Amelia Lenard Jones, President Obama, yes. Call forth the names of the people you show up with. The people who call forth the greatness in you, who remind you like the fairy godmother that you are special and that you are called for such a time as this to fight for liberation, to continue the journey, to restore, to join the revolution. Who do you show up with? Phyllis, dad, mom, Mary Brooks, these are the folks who surround you. These are the folks who surround you. Your son, Harold, spouse, Glenn. These are the folks who surround you. As you continue to be transformed, as we all are, it is a lifelong experience. My hope is that you remember who you're surrounded by that you remember that your specialness is a communal effort, not an individual effort. May this be so, Ashe and Amen. As I climb the highest mountain, as I run the longest race, as I wade the deepest waters, I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded, even in uncertain. Even when the world seems cold, there a flash of lightning hits, and I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded. Oh, I'm surrounded. I'm surrounded. I show up with will. Now I'm heard 
they come before so now i'm heard i'm So I can stand at my side. So I can stand at my side. So I can stand.